Hello and welcome back to my channel, or if this is the first video of mine you're seeing, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. My name's Hannah and I make a lot of content about anti-MLM on this channel. So as always, I link my big anti-MLM playlist at the beginning of the video for you. We're over 190 videos at this time. And if you love this kind of content, I would love it if you would consider subscribing, liking this video, leaving a comment, all those things really help to support the channel and get the anti-MLM message out there further. And what I have for you today is another MLM horror stories video. These are people's personal experiences that they've had with MLM companies. They write them out. They send to me. I pick out a few to read for a video. And I always like to say that I can never, ever, ever have too many stories. I think I have like 1500 in my inbox right now, which sounds like a lot, but that's a great problem to have. I'm always looking for more. And thank you so much. If you did send in your story to me, I can't wait to read it. So without further ado, let's read these stories today. This story says, hi, Hannah, I want to start by thanking you for all you're doing to raise awareness regarding the dangers of joining MLMs. Young living completely consumed me for three whole years. From the age of 30 to 33, I was on a mission to rank to diamond in young living. Keep in mind, I had a full-time job and three little girls. So I have a ton of guilt and regret for giving up so much of my life to young living during these years, all because I was fed lie after lie that it would all be worth it when I could quit my full-time job and make six figures. Yes, the fallacy and MLMs of hustling now to reap the rewards down the road that never actually comes to fruition. I first started Young Living because I was interested in essential oils. They were intriguing to me. I joined through the daughter of one of my mom's friends. She was running the biz and spoke of how amazing it was, the potential to make a ton of money, and also spoke of some outrageous health claims regarding the oils and other products. I got my starter kit and hit the ground running. My Facebook and Instagram were completely taken over by all things Young Living, trying everything everything I could to sell to my family and friends. I will say that social media marketing in that way was completely exhausting. I was consumed with getting likes and attention because I thought that would lead to sales and recruits. When I should have been giving my full attention to my babies, I was halfway engaging with them and halfway on my phone obsessing over social media interactions. Every single encounter I had was for one purpose, to make a sale. This wasn't me, not at all. I still look back in agony that I let myself stay roped in for so long. I sent countless cold messages to friends and acquaintances all in the name of catching up. I didn't want to catch up. I wanted a sale. It's so ingenuous, disgusting, and it makes my stomach turn to this day. It was widely taught, don't give up on someone until they've told you no seven times. I can't tell you how uncomfortable it was reaching out to people after they already told me no. These tactics, along with many others, were all taught to us by our uplines and MLM coaches. They should have had me running, but the brainwashing and manipulation kept me in. We were told not to put Young Living in our bio because, quote, you don't want people Googling it. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> They claimed it was because they would just Google and sign up with someone else. But looking back, I know exactly why this was taught across the board by multiple leaders. Information control. Exactly. Being a part of this company caused tension between my husband and I. One time we had another couple over for dinner. Well, because I was knee deep in young living, I had one mission to make a sale. My husband, of course, didn't have that same mission. When I started talking about young living with the lady who was over, my husband jokingly said, oh man, don't let her rope you into her pyramid scheme. I immediately became angry and it was because I was so desperate to make a sale. Of course, he didn't realize that. He didn't realize that for an entire three years of my life, I felt like a constant failure because I wasn't ranking up. It was depressing, but I tried my best to hide it. Another thing that caused tension between my husband and I was finances. Not only did I have to spend a minimum of $100 a month to get paid, but I would always end up spending more because Young Living gave free products out if you hit certain tiers each month. Yes, I had way more oils than I ever needed which as I'm sure you know now is called inventory loading. And you say here, you have to spend a minimum of $100 a month to get your paycheck. That is the truth. For anyone who's not familiar with the Young Living Compensation Plan, that is how it works. There is a $100 quota you have to fill every single month if you wanna be eligible to get your commissions check. They're not gonna send your check to you if you don't have at least $100 in sales or purchases. If I remember correctly, it's kind of like the bottom half of the compensation plan. You can hit this $100 by selling or by purchasing thing, but most of the time people just purchase it because it's really hard to sell it. But if you hit a certain rank or above in Young Living, now you have to hit that $100 quota without selling.
selling. You can only hit it by purchasing. So literally, this is a pay to play situation. You have to be spending your own money every single month in Young Living if you wanna get a paycheck. That's one of the eligibility requirements to get your check sent to you. So naturally, people who are in Young Living have massive quantities of oils in their possession because they've essentially been required to purchase it month after month after month. That's why we see people in Young Living inventory loading probably more than any other MLM I've seen. On top of that, I signed up for paid coaching programs. Diamonds in Young Living would have paid Facebook groups where they would coach you, but the biggest expense went to the MLM coaches. I signed up for programs with Bob Heilig, Eric Worre, Martha Krejci, and more. I was desperate and literally tried everything. My husband tried to be supportive, but was valid in his concerns. I justified it by saying, if I just stick it out a little longer, it'll all pay off. Boy, was I naive and wrong with that vision. We were told in order to grow your business to attend events, convention, MLM events, etc. I never liked attending events, especially when I was told I could rank up to diamond from my phone. <laughs> That's true. That's a really good point. Yeah, join our opportunity and work the business from your phone and make all this money from your phone in the comfort of your own home, but also come to these events, come to this convention, come on these work retreats and stuff. Like (laughs) they sell it to you one way and then they bait and switch you. And actually you have to attend these things and you have to oftentimes pay to attend these things as well. Looking back, I can see why we were pushed so hard to attend. It's nothing but a giant brainwashing session. They charge a ton of money to get in and stand there and give one motivational speech after another. There's nothing done at those events that would increase your income, yet they are marketed to grow your business. In my three years with Young Living, I only ranked to senior star, which is the second rank. My checks were around $75 to $100 a month, sometimes less, and as you can guess, I spent way more than I ever made. I'd love to see some deep dives on your channel into MLM coaches. Those are part of what kept me in for so long. The brainwashing done by those coaches is unreal. That would be an interesting video topic for sure because MLM coaches, these are people that may or may not be in an MLM themselves, but they're absolutely capitalizing and profiting off the desperation of people in MLMs. And they're selling masterclasses, webinars, coaching sessions, courses, conferences, where you come and listen to them talk to you about how to be successful in your MLM. All of them claiming to have the secrets to success, but at the end of the day, there's nothing they can tell you that's gonna make you successful in an MLM if you don't recruit a downline. That's just the way it is. MLM coaches are a scam within themselves. My cringy Facebook lives, cold messages, believing everything the leader said, especially that it would make me six figures, falling for the manipulation, spending so much money. None of those things compare to spending the first three years of my 30s thinking of myself as a constant failure. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Now I know that it wasn't me, it was the business model, but I still wish I hadn't ever started in that world. What finally made me wake up and lay the business down, I can't say. It wasn't any one thing, I think I just became sick and tired. I stopped in December of 2021, that was right when a lot of people who were once in Young Living started speaking out against the company. After I stopped working the business, I didn't post on social media for a long time. To be honest, I still don't post a lot because it brings up so many bad memories. As soon as I stepped away from Young living, amazing things started happening in my life. I was promoted at work and we were able to build our home we now live in. If anything, it taught me to do my research and to pay attention to the source. Yes. I hope my story can help someone else. Your channel, including the stories of others, has helped me break free from some of the guilt. I hope I can do that for someone else. I enjoy your cat's cameos in your videos. We adopted two cats who are brothers and like Zeke and Cooper, they are complete opposites. Oh, I love that. Adopting two cats at once is the best thing I've ever done, I think. Little side tangent, I know this is not the point of your story, but it took a lot of convincing for my husband to get me to adopt both cats at once. I have two cats, if you didn't know. Zeke is the loud one who makes an appearance in like every single video. Cooper, quiet, timid, love him, complete teddy bear. He's usually just curled up, snuggled somewhere around me, but doesn't cause a nuisance in the videos. And just a little fun fact, we adopted them from the shelter. They're brothers from the same litter. They were born in the shelter. And actually when I locked eyes with Cooper, I was like, that's the kitten we're getting. I need him, he's perfect. Instant soulmate connection with Cooper, okay? And then, Because they were the last two of their litter left in the shelter, the workers came over and said, well, if you want, if you wanna take both of them, we'll give you a buy one, get one free kind of deal. And it took a lot of convincing for me from my husband because I did not want two cats, I just wanted Cooper. (laughs) 
And I would say we stood there for, I don't know, probably like 15, 20 minutes trying to discuss if we were gonna get both cats or not. In the end, AJ won. He convinced me to get Zeke for free on a BOGO deal from the shelter. So that's how Zeke came to be. And now I could not imagine my life any other way. He's part of the family. He's part of this channel. Could you imagine my videos without Zeke? I just, I couldn't. He's essential. This is his channel. I'm just a guest star on it, okay? Anyway, completely not the point of your story. Huge tangent. I just think that's such a fun fact that I like to tell people that Zeke was free and it took a lot of convincing for me to adopt him. <laughs> But I have to say, stories of your type from people who were in an MLM, they gave it a good, honest shot for like three years. They did everything they could. They worked as hard as they could. They paid for the MLM coaches. They attended all the conferences. They were doing everything right. And they still decided at the end of the day, this is a scam. I wish I could say that I was shocked when you say that you spent three years in Young Living and you only ranked up to the second rank and your paychecks were only like 75 to hundred dollars a month. That is shocking. That's not okay. We should not be spending three years of our lives doing something that's supposed to be our job or our side hustle or whatever and only make that much money. But while it's shocking, it's not really surprising for MLMs. I just love getting these kinds of stories from people who have been in it, done it, worked it as hard as they could, done everything right by the book, and they still come out and say, this was not a good experience. This is a scam. I was still brainwashed. I still didn't make any money. And after all of that, in hindsight, it wasn't worth my time. It's these firsthand experiences that are so, so powerful for other people listening because you are like the perfect exhibit A example of what happens to most people when they join an MLM company. Your story is so common and by you being willing to share that are hopefully making other people feel less alone. Thank you so much. This story is a bit unique in the sense that it wasn't necessarily written to me as a horror story. This was just somebody who had a firsthand witness account to an Arbonne retreat. They were at the same location that an Arbonne retreat was happening and they have their own very interesting observations and things they saw go on. I talked with the writer of this story and let her know that I was gonna be including it in a horror stories video, but it's a bit unique in the sense that there are screenshots to kind of go with the story. And it's pretty fascinating. I think you're really gonna enjoy this one. So the title of it says, Unwitting Witness to an Arbonne Retreat, The Background. My husband and I recently took a weekend trip to a beautiful oceanfront cottage resort on Vancouver Island. I had a scent detection competition with my basset hound nearby on the Saturday morning, and my husband wanted to do some road cycling, so we decided to make a weekend of it. The resort consists of about 30 or so cottages split into units, all on a cliffside overlooking the ocean. Some of the units are condos with owners who either live there full time or rent them out through the management company, and some of them are exclusively vacation rentals. It's a really beautiful property, the cottages are lovely, and the scenery is stunning. It was already dark when we arrived at the resort on Friday night, and because of the remote location without streetlights or light pollution, it was extra dark. As we were bumbling around trying to find our cottage and unload the car, we noticed several groups of young women all walking along in the dark, using their phone flashlights to guide them. They were all headed to a cottage near ours, so I assumed it was a bachelorette party or something similar. Before bedtime, I took the dog out for a quick bathroom break and passed the cottage that they had all been walking towards. I noticed a poster taped to the front of the door, which looked out of place since none of the other cottages had any kind of signage on the doors. I looked a bit closer and I thought I saw the word Arbonne on it, but it was so dark I couldn't be sure. Plus, it was not written in Arbonne's official font, but rather some sort of collegiate one. It looked like someone had used Canva to create a logo with Arbonne surrounded by a circle of writing. It seemed odd that it was not the official logo, so perhaps the bride's last name was Arbonne? Anyway, I promptly forgot about the whole thing and went to bed. On Saturday morning, my husband and I went off to our activities and we returned to the cottage around lunchtime. As I was pulling in, I noticed the same groups of women walking around the property, but this time I noticed they were all wearing matching t-shirts with the same logo as the poster. My brain started to compute. Arbonne, matching t-shirts, young women in their 20s and 30s and a big group. This must be an Arbonne retreat. Turned out the words in the circle read power to promotion. I was thrilled because I am absolutely obsessed with MLMs and here we were unwitting bystanders to an actual retreat. 
Truth be told, we barely interacted with them other than saying hi and smiling when we walked past each other as we were walking the dog. We were out most of the afternoon and they were busy with whatever they were doing, but it was kind of fun to know that some sort of brainwashing was going on next door. We went out in the afternoon, got an early dinner in town, and then came back to the cottage around 6.30 p.m. The plan was to watch the sunset and then either read our books or play a board game, but when we walked in and tried to turn the lights on, nothing happened. It had been a very windy day and we had passed a hydro truck on our way in, so there must have been a line down somewhere. The power was out. It was completely dark by 7.30 p.m., and as I mentioned, this location was devoid of any ambient light, so it was basically pitch black. The cottage supplied only one tiny flashlight, so reading and board games were kind of out of the question. The only thing I could think to do was stalk the Arbon Huns on Instagram. I used the location of the resort as a starting point. I found the accounts that had tagged themselves there, quickly identified those who were Huns, it's so easy, and then followed their tags of each other to identify some of the key players and piece together what the retreat was all about. Did I spend several hours in a cold, dark cottage drinking wine, eating chips, and stalking random strangers on Instagram? Yes. Yes, I did. What can I say? I have weird hobbies. It was a fascinating rabbit hole to dive down, and I got a pretty good idea of what was going on. I have to say, if I was in your situation, I would be doing the exact same thing. You better believe it. Because it's the behavior that is so fascinating and intriguing. And when you have an MLM retreat going on right next door to you, you want to kind of get a peek into what it's all about. I totally get that. And like you said, it is unbelievably easy to find these people through Instagram. They're tagging each other. They're tagging their location. They're making it so, so easy to triangulate who is involved here. And yeah, I would do the exact same thing. It's so fascinating. I would not be able to help myself. On Sunday morning, I got up quite early and spent a couple hours watching the ocean outside our cottage. I'm into birding, so I had brought my binoculars. As I was scanning the sea and sky for anything interesting, I heard voices in the distance and my eyes alighted upon an entirely different species. Huns on a cliff. <laughs> Across the small cove that our cottage faced was a rocky outcropping maybe 300 meters away. The Huns had gathered there and were all taking turns to snap pictures of themselves, arms around each other or in yoga poses. It was hilarious to watch. When they weren't posing, they just stood around awkwardly, waiting for others to finish. Some of them even got precariously close to the edge of the outcropping, which is probably 10 meters above the water with lots of rocks below. I took a couple of very zoomed in photos of them from our balcony. I encountered them as I was walking the dog around the property and I began to recognize some of them from their Instagram accounts. It was like they were in a uniform, matching t-shirts, leggings or bike shorts, ankle socks, and running shoes. A lot of them were storying as they were walking, holding their phones out in front of them and narrating what they were doing, or posing for awkward performative friendship photos from behind with their arms around each other. But when the cameras were off, they were just kind of normal. It was super interesting to see their Instagram persona switch off when they didn't feel the need to have their phones out. That is very interesting. And that's something I think about a lot, actually. I followed this Instagram account called Influencers in the Wild. It's hilarious. It's people who will see influencers in the wild doing their thing, filming a TikTok video or an Instagram story or posing for a photo or whatever. And it's so meta because it's an Instagram account dedicated to posting content of other people posting content. And it is weird to see people filming content out in the wild. I completely get that. I personally do not have the self-confidence to do something like that. I would never think to be like Instagram storying myself out in the wild. There's a reason that I film YouTube videos from the comfort of my own home with nobody else watching because it is kind of weird or cringy or fascinating to see somebody like turn on a personality for a camera and putting all of this effort into making their lives look a certain very aesthetic particular way for social media when in reality, it doesn't actually look anything like that. You're doing a great job painting this picture for me. I'm completely imagining like a group of women who all have their phones out and they're taking pictures and they're taking Instagram stories and yada, yada, yada. And then they just have their phones down, facing their phone, editing the story, posting the story, making a caption. It is weird. It is performative it does feel like a persona that they're putting on. And I'm sure that this entire retreat for them was like a content bonanza where so much of their time and energy is dedicated to trying to portray a life that others should desire. That's the piece of it that I think is so interesting actually is that 
If you're looking at the world through your eyes in this situation, everything is just normal. It's just reality. But then if you look at the same situation through the phones of these Arbon reps, I'm sure they've got angles and filters and some kind of motivational caption, something to glamorize it, right? It's the same exact moment. It's the same exact view, but through your own eyeball lens versus your phone lens is a very different thing. It's very easy to take an otherwise ordinary situation and romanticize it for social media. And I think it is so incredibly fascinating that you're catching this and you're watching it all play out in real time. Late Sunday morning, we all checked out at the same time, so I got to observe the Huns packing their cars, including a couple of the fabled Arbon white Mercedes. They had brought a lot of stuff for just two days of mostly sitting around in a cottage. Lots of alcohol, ring lights, suitcases, I'm sure lots of Arbon products as well. They all lollygagged in the parking lot, taking selfies, photos, storying. Our assigned parking stall was on a downward incline, so my husband had to gun the car a little just to get up the hill in reverse. A couple of oblivious Huns were in our way as he was trying to reverse, blithely storying their departure in the path of a large SUV that could not easily stop. Thankfully, they moved out of the way just in time. This next section of your story is called Online Research. If I hadn't been so terribly nosy and obsessed with pyramid schemes, and if the power hadn't been cut, I wouldn't have thought that much of the large group of women sharing the resort. However, my hours of Instagram stalking yielded some pretty interesting results. I got a much fuller picture of what they were actually doing next door. I will include screenshots and a couple of screen recordings of some of the more interesting parts. According to various accounts I was stalking, this was a retreat for the top 8% of the company. I guess in one particular downline, and about 60 women attended. It certainly did seem to be a large group from what I saw. Most of them were in their 20s or 30s, but there were also definitely some older women in their late 50s or even 60s. They came from all over Canada, even as far away as Nova Scotia, which is about a seven hour flight in addition to driving and a ferry ride. The person who organized the retreat and seemed to be the leader of this particular team is Kay. According to her bio, she owns several fancy properties that she rents out on Airbnb, including one of the cottages at this resort, the one that had the poster on the door, meaning it would not have cost her anything extra to be there. Giving her the benefit of the doubt, maybe she was able to get a discount for her team. Nonetheless, it was a pretty expensive place to stay. One bedroom start at $350 per night. Flights within Canada are very expensive too. Even to fly within the province can easily cost $500. The ferry is at least $150 with a car. Based on my knowledge of other MLM retreats, conferences, and free trips, I highly doubt that she covered anyone's travel expenses or cottage rentals. Some Huns had Instagram stories up of grocery shopping before their arrival too, although there was catering provided at least one night we were there. In my cringy photo folder, there is a photo of the bunk bed squad, a group of four Huns who must have shared a cottage. None of the cottages actually have bunk beds, so I assume that they were sharing a bed, sleeping on the couch, the floor, etc. If my job involved a work retreat where I would have to pay my own way, provide my own groceries, and potentially share a bed or couch with a relative stranger for two nights, that would be a hard no. To be clear, there's nothing wrong with women sharing a bed, but it would be weird to have to do so in any sort of professional context. And it would be even weirder if you didn't know the other person very well. Yeah, I completely agree. If you look at any other like professional work trip situation, this would never happen, I feel like. There might be potential that you'd have to share a hotel room with a colleague where you each have your own queen bed or something like that, but this is not normal in a legitimate business context. It is normal in MLM context because it's not really your own business and this is not really a work trip. This is sort of like a mini vacation that you're paying to go on to spend time with other people on your team and therefore be taught, coached, instructed, brainwashed by people in your upline. A setup like this would not happen in a professional context. This is not a work trip. This is a girl's trip, a vacation. The actual content of the retreat was the usual drivel. Lots of speakers sharing their stories on how they found success, personal development, love bombing, lots of photo shoots, both of the products and people. There were multiple stories from different attendees, all of the same speakers with the usual captions about how amazing they are, how inspiring their stories are, blah, blah, blah. Here's some observations from Instagram stories and reels. So many photos and videos. I started to lose count of how many pictures of videos I saw of this two night event. 
And then everyone would restory the other people's photos, turning it into a massive echo chamber. Group shots, scenery shots, product shots, arms around shoulders, peace signs, performative friendship photos. Phones out all the time. Every mundane thing was being recorded. When they were just walking around on the property, they acted like normal adult women, but put on these fake personas for their reels and stories and photos. R was a big culprit for storying while she walked around. I noticed her doing it while I was out with the dog. I have watched several stories of people doing this, but I've never seen it in the wild. The property had stairs everywhere. I would not want to be distracted by staring into my phone while trying to navigate steep staircases. I don't really understand the purpose of doing this. She was not doing anything particularly noteworthy at the time, just walking between cottages to the gym or whatever. Not exactly compelling content and not worth a head injury or a broken ankle. Yes, I agree with you. And my theory as to why they do this is maybe because they want to seem important or busy or like they're really good at multitasking or they just have so much time freedom that they can be a boss babe and work on the go, that kind of thing. And yeah, I have seen people's Instagram stories or like a live stream or something that they're doing as they're walking or God forbid, as they're driving or something. But I bet it's a whole other experience to see it happening right in front of you as they're walking, holding their phone in front of them. Because I've I've always thought whatever you're saying at that particular moment, it can wait, especially if you're driving, okay? I can almost guarantee that whatever you're saying about your business opportunity or about this retreat or how amazing it is or how you're missing out on it, it can wait until you're not walking down steep staircases or until you're not behind the wheel of a vehicle. That kind of thing drives me crazy because I can almost guarantee it's not that important. The training sessions in Kay's cottage were totally packed. I've included a couple of photos to show just how rammed it was with Huns on every available surface just crammed into the space. It looks claustrophobic and super uncomfortable, not to mention unhygienic with COVID rearing its head again. In a couple of photos I've included in the speakers folder, you can even see that some Huns are sitting on a bed while listening and taking notes. Ugh, I cannot imagine being forced to sit on a bed at any type of professional event. And I would not want to sleep in that bed later knowing a bunch of people were sitting on it and messing it up. No, thank you. Dozens of the Huns I found made posts or reels of the scenery with captions like, if your work trip doesn't look like this, we need to talk. Someone must have coached them to say that. It cannot be a coincidence that so many of them use the same exact phrase or words to that effect. I've compiled a few in a folder with that title. The emphasis, not surprisingly, is more on the fun and the community and the potential to go on trips like this rather than the products or what your work actually entails. I've been to a number of conferences and such for my work, and I never feel the need to show off how amazing the experience is. And often such events are in fact dry and uninspiring. Conferences, work retreats, and professional development programs are all pretty standard with regular jobs. And shockingly, they can also be held in areas of outstanding natural beauty. And a real job would pay for everything. For example, my employer sent me on a two week, all expenses paid work exchange trip to Bhutan, and I didn't feel the need to constantly gloat about it on Instagram. I just enjoyed the trip. And that's because you're not using your work trip as a recruitment strategy. You have nothing to prove or boast about or try to convince people is so great they need it too. That's the entire reason they're documenting their work trip is because they're using it as a selling point in a way that people with actual jobs don't have to do. Each hun got a jar with their name and picture on it and everyone else had to write love notes and stick them in the jars. Gag, talk about love bombing. Final thoughts. Despite all the performative photos and videos to show off how they were all BFFs, it was clear that most of them didn't actually know each other very well at all. So I overheard a lot of normal conversation that you would expect to hear from young women who are at an event and getting to know each other. No overblown expressions of adoration in person like I saw on Instagram. Very interesting. To give them some credit, everyone we interacted with was very friendly. We said hi to each other as we passed by. A lot of them complimented my dog. This is a surefire way to ingratiate yourself with me anyway, so they can't all be terrible people. Even Kay, the leader, came across as warm and likable when I observed her helping some of the others pack up and check out on Sunday. They were also all really respectful and friendly to a housekeeping staff member who was sort of supervising during checkout. And that's always a good sign for me. I've watched other MLM retreats, conferences, trips on Instagram, and they always look like total gong shows with obnoxious huns running wild, but these folks were very quiet and pleasant. 
Despite being such a big group, we never heard any noise from them at all. It was gratifying to see that they all seemed to be decent people and not nightmarish catty huns, but this actually makes me feel worse about the whole situation. Looking through their Instagram accounts, a lot of them seem to fall into one of two camps, either women in their earlier mid-20s who are struggling to find their footing, or mothers of young children who have given up their careers for now. Both sets of women are clearly looking for belonging, friendship, and a sense of purpose, and Arbonne is preying on them. I hope that in the very least they enjoyed their weekend getaway in a beautiful location. Maybe it gave them a little break from their responsibilities at home and a chance to enjoy nature. The weather was lovely, windstorm notwithstanding, and the people did seem genuinely pleasant. Just a little lost, perhaps. As for my husband and myself, we had a really great weekend. My dog and I ended up winning one of our events with a perfect score, and my husband tackled some challenging cycling trails. And then we just got to enjoy each other's company. We went out to eat, tried a local brewery, walked on the beach, and so on. We took a few photos, but mostly we just lived in the present. Reflecting on what was happening next door to us, the fake friendships, nonstop photos, brainwashing, forced togetherness, I feel truly grateful for the life of actual freedom I have. Wow, okay, definitely not the traditional horror story, but I love this perspective. This last segment about your final thoughts and the fact that all the Arbon reps seem to be really lovely people. They're kind. They're kind of keeping to themselves. They're not making some crazy scene at this resort. They're not making it a nightmare for everybody else staying there, that kind of thing. I think that's really important to talk about and to recognize that most of the time, people who get involved with MLMs are just normal, typical, everyday people. <laughs> And it's not always as outlandish as you see on social media because of this whole persona that is put on for social media. Like we already talked about, it's really easy to glamorize, romanticize your life for your Instagram followers because you're trying to sell them the lifestyle you're pretending to have. But as soon as the phone is turned off and the camera stops rolling, these are just regular women trying to find their way. And I always wanna take every opportunity possible to say out loud and remind everybody that being in an MLM does not make you a bad person. It might make you do things that you wouldn't otherwise do, but as you said, they weren't quote, nightmarish catty huns. I really appreciate you taking the time to write out this entire situation and as well, compile a Google Drive with all of these screenshots and stuff. Because what you've just done for us is you've given us the perfect juxtaposition between social media and real life to really drive home the point that social media is not reality. And we can find ourselves in a little bit of trouble when people in MLM companies try and paint their lives in a very specific way to make you believe that that is the reality. As you brought up in your story, these women likely spent a lot of money to be here and likely made some sacrifices, whether that be time away from their family, time they could have spent relaxing or doing something otherwise productive. All for what? So you can travel to this resort, spend a ton of money to spend time with people you don't really know that well. Also, you can have your faces in your phones the entire weekend and treat it like an opportunity for content. And let's not forget that they're all calling this a quote, work trip, but I'd like to know how much they all got paid for being on this work trip. <laughs> Again, it's another example of people not actually making any money and instead spending a ton of their money to portray a picture of a life that they're not actually living. It feels like we're living in the twilight zone a little bit. I have to say this story is extremely fascinating to me. It's not conventional, it's not typical, but I think you bring up a lot of food for thought regarding MLMs and regarding the social media aspect of it. So thank you so much for writing this one in. This next story is very short, but it brings up something I've never heard about before. So I absolutely want to share it on this channel and kind of platform this and spread the word a little bit. It says, hi, Hannah, please keep me anonymous as I am still friends with the person that this story is about. I did marry Kay for three years. And although I'm a statistic, this story isn't about me. I don't think many people know that it's possible to earn a retirement from Mary Kay. However, it is no easy feat and the company makes it very difficult to qualify for a retirement. You have to reach the rank of national sales director, one of the top ranks in the company by a certain age. I have someone that I consider a friend that has been in Mary Kay for 40 plus years. She has been a consistent Cadillac driver and can regularly be seen walking the stage at their yearly seminar. A few years ago, she was ready to shoot for the rank of national and then be eligible for the retirement. She missed the rank by a very small margin and was told that she missed the age cutoff and would never be able to try again to reach this rank. 
the company wouldn't consider making a concession or exception, even considering her long history in the company. I feel like she was way more disappointed than she let on. Can you imagine working for a company for over 40 years? And once you reach a certain age, they say, thanks, but you didn't reach the requirement. Therefore, you aren't eligible for a paid retirement through us, but feel free to keep making us money. She's now in her 70s and still working her business. This woman is precious and it breaks my heart knowing that she has devoted almost an entire lifetime to an MLM, especially knowing what I know now about these companies. Thank you for all you're doing in this space. Okay, so I have never heard about this before, the Mary Kay retirement plan. So of course I did a little bit of digging on it. Here's one article I found about this retirement plan program. I can link it below for you if you wanna read the whole thing, but it says of Mary Kay's 2.7 million salespeople worldwide, there are only 200 national sales directors plus about 155 retired ones. National sales directors are eligible to participate in a Mary Kay program called the family program, under which participating national sales directors receive payments after they retire based on a reduced percentage of the sales commissions they received while they were working for the company, if they agree to retire at age 65. A national sales director who retires after putting in 15 years at that level is entitled to payments equal to 60% of her final average commissions for 15 years. So this obviously is not a retirement program or retirement plan in the traditional sense, because after all, when you're a salesperson for Mary Kay, you're not an employee for them. You're an independent contractor. So therefore they don't give you a retirement plan. However, it does seem like if you maintain this rank and you stay there for a long enough amount of time, then we're gonna give you some kind of kickback in which we repay you for your dedication and efforts to this company. That's kind of how it's striking me. But it's so conditional, right? Like you have to be at a certain age and at a certain rank, maintain a certain level of performance. And it's like, if you check, check, check all these boxes, then you get the kickback. And it sounds like this person who is your friend that you know personally did not check all those boxes and maybe even missed it by a very small margin. Just imagine dedicating, like you said, an entire lifetime to an MLM company and still be working for the MLM company as a salesperson into your 70s. I personally just can't fathom something like that. That just seems so unpredictable, unstable. And then to get to the age of 70 and kind of have to come to the realization that a retirement might not be in your future, that's crushing. And I hate to say it, but that's how MLMs work. That's how being an independent contractor works. You're not an employee. This company doesn't owe you anything at all. You signed up to work for them. You're paying to work for them. So they really can just like wipe their hands clean of you and not really give a crap about your retirement or your loyalty to the company at the end of the day, because why would they? You're not their employee. They can kind of turn it back around on you and say, well, this was your decision to stay with us for this long. And if you didn't plan for your own retirement, then that's your own fault. <laughs> and unfortunately, they have a point. That's how being an independent contractor works. As unfortunate as that is when you get to be 40 years down the line and have nothing to show for it. I know this is an extremely unique case and that most people are not gonna be stuck in an MLM for decades on decades and they're not gonna make it their entire career. However, it kind of is a cautionary tale that if being in an MLM is standing in as your full-time job for any amount of time, you have to consider that you're not getting any other benefits outside of the income you're making. And it's probably worth considering what this is gonna look like 5, 10, 15, 25 years down the road. MLM companies owe you nothing, which is made very clear by your story. This story says, hi Hannah, I have a lot of MLM horror stories, but I needed to write to you and tell you this particular story since it is sad and funny at the same time. Please excuse potential spelling mistakes. English is not my first language, not a problem. Don't have to apologize for that. Back in the day in 2011, when I was 20, I worked at a hotel restaurant part-time to earn some money while studying at the university. One of my coworkers was a woman in her late forties and had a daughter my age who was also a waitress, but at a different restaurant within a nicer area with a richer clientele. Let's call her Sandy. I connected with Sandy since she came to visit her mom sometimes when she had a work-free day and we chatted here and there. Sometimes we would also have drinks or dinner together with her mom after work. We lost touch when I stopped working at the restaurant but stayed connected on Instagram. A couple years later in 2017, she started making strange postings and stories on Instagram. She was talking differently and acted with very strange behavior. She talked about how life goals and health were very important and that she would now invest in her health and financial future. 
She used such strange language and all these emojis in her posts and stories. I reached out to a different ex coworker from the restaurant and asked about Sandy's strange Instagram posts. This coworker agreed and said that he had also wondered why she was acting weird. Isn't that funny that people who actually know you in real life now start seeing you posting about your MLM and they can kind of pick up on the fact that that's not really you. That's not really your tone. That's not something that they think you would actually post. And while it is you making the posts, it's sort of like it's not your character to be doing that kind of thing. And it comes across as strange or different behavior than you would usually have. And I think that's because when you join an MLM, you kind of, to an extent, have to take on a different type of persona. I've said it before in previous videos that it's almost like you have to rebrand yourself. Like, oh, now you're the MLM girl, the Herbalife girl, the Arbonne girl, the Monate girl, whatever. It's like you flip a switch. And as soon as you join that MLM company, now everything on your social media belongs to the company. It's not really yours anymore. And it's very clear to everyone looking at that post, especially the people who know you in real life, that if you weren't in the MLM, MLM company, you probably wouldn't be posting things like that. And it does come off a little bit disingenuous. And it leaves the people who do know you in real life to ask questions. What has she gotten herself into? This is weird. A few posts later, Stacy started to promote all of these supplements, shakes, and pills that would be the holy grail to health, fitness, and finances, Juice Plus. As soon as I Googled the company, it got clear to me, Sandy got sucked into a pyramid scheme. I felt pity for her, but did not think of it much until Sandy reached out to me on Instagram. Hey girl, long time no here. I have an amazing opportunity for you. You would be so great at what I do and pitched the whole opportunity. I texted her that I was not interested. She accepted and said that if I changed my mind, I could reach out to her. A few months later, I got another message from her. Hey girl, long time no here. I have an amazing opportunity for you. You would be so great at what I do. And she pitched me basically with the same wording as the first time. I was confused since I knew that I had denied her offer a few months back already. I also wondered why I could not find the original messages in the chat until I realized she now had a second Instagram account that she texted me from. I don't know what that was for since she basically used both Instagram pages for nothing but her Juice Plus MLM. I texted Sandy again that I was not interested. This time she did not let go that easily. She tried to convince me to get on one of her Zoom calls to give this opportunity a try. I said no again, but she did not stop there. But you should at least try the product, she said, and that she would send me a sample of the protein powder or supplement pills. I said no again. She still did not stop, but I saw you're into fitness. You should really try the protein powder at least. I'm sure you will be amazed at how awesome this protein shake is. I got angry and I told her again that I was not interested and if she did not stop annoying me with her MLM, I would block her. She seemed to be miffed, but she stopped texting me and I stopped following her. It's such a bummer that she pressed you to the point of threatening to block her because you said no, how many times? Two, three times? And she's not respecting that and she's being relentless. And you're like, look lady, if you're not gonna stop, I'm gonna have to block you. You leave me no choice. <laughs> I can't think of that many other circumstances where somebody you haven't seen in a long time is coming into your Instagram DMs and not taking no for an answer. It feels like only in MLMs do we see that kind of behavior. Fast forward to last year, she reached out to me again. This time she seemed really desperate. Hey girl, I have to ask for a huge favor. I could really use your help. I need one more person to sign up, blah, blah, blah. I didn't even read the rest of this very long message since I was very deep into anti-MLM at this point and I knew for from the first phrase that she was probably needing to fill some kind of quota since it was close to the end of the month. I answered that I was still not interested and that I was anti-MLM and I would not support this kind of business model. She again reacted miffed, yeah, if you say so. I checked her then recent Instagram posts and stories and she was completely desperate. She was so desperate in her wording to get these final recruits, it made me cringe. Two days later, it was the last day of the month and I had already forgotten about her when she sent me another message from her second Instagram account with basically the same message as two days before. Does she realize that she's double messaging you? I imagine that it would be really difficult to keep track of who you've messaged and who you haven't if you have two different accounts and two different inboxes, especially if it's crunch time at the end of the month and you're desperately and frantic messaging everybody you possibly can. You just have to wonder, does she know that she's messaged you twice? Maybe she does and this is intentional, but honestly, maybe she doesn't. I'm sure that her inboxes are filled with the same copy and paste message to a whole bunch of different accounts. It wouldn't surprise me if she just genuinely didn't know that she messaged you before on the other account. 
At this point, I was not sure if I should laugh or cry. Not only that she obviously did not even remember that she had already texted me two days prior from her first account, and I already told her no three times by this point, but she also apparently was so desperate to copy and paste this message to God knows how many people on Instagram from both of her accounts. I did not answer that time. She apparently did not know at all to whom she had already reached out to. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think that's probably the likely case. A few days later, I checked her Instagram accounts again, and obviously she reached her goal with quote, all of their team effort, which sounded to me, and I'm making assumptions here, that they bought their ranks or whatever. I asked myself if she was really that happy in the end, since she seemed so desperate and stressed out in her postings to hit this quota. It would cause me so much stress if I had to undergo that kind of pressure every month. It is just sad. I hope she will eventually realize how crappy this business model is and get out. Also, why do these Huns have multiple accounts on Instagram? Do you know? Thanks for providing this anti-MLM channel. Give your kitty some extra pets for me. As far as having multiple accounts, I really don't know. The thing that I've seen most commonly if somebody in an MLM does have two accounts is that one is their personal account and then once they join the MLM, they make a second one completely dedicated to the MLM and to recruiting and promoting the product. So that way their original account isn't overrun with all of those things all of a sudden, but it sounds like this person has two different accounts that are both overrun with Juice Plus promotion. So I'm not really sure what the point in having two accounts would be if that's the case. To me, that just seems like a lot of extra work to manage because like you said, it's clear that she can't keep track of who she's messaged and who she hasn't. Having two accounts makes that infinitely more difficult and it's more work on her in the end because now she's double messaging the same person. She's having the same conversation twice with the same person. So like, I don't understand why you'd have two accounts personally. If anybody does have a hunch as to why this would be a good idea, let me know down below. Like I said, I can understand if one is personal and one is for business, but that doesn't seem like the case here. So I'm not sure. And as far as this speculation, maybe that all of their team effort got them to hit their quota at the end of the month might have something to do with rank buying, bonus buying. I think that's sadly a fair assumption. And what you mean by this, of course, is that the people on the team are placing their own orders to fulfill their own sales quotas to then hit their own ranks and get their own bonuses rather than getting those sales from outside retail customers like you, because clearly that's proving to be very difficult for her and desperate times call for desperate measures sometimes. And when you get to the end of the month, the clock is ticking. You're super close to this goal, but you can't find anybody to buy anything. The easy way out in that moment can feel like placing an order for yourself, spending your own money to therefore fulfill these quotas and achieve these ranks. We have proof of this happening in MLM companies. It's not unheard of. And it sounds like that may have happened in this case because she was super desperate up until the last minute and then somehow pulled it out at the end, right? That's one of the massive contributing factors to people in MLMs losing money. If they run their numbers at the end of the day and see how much money they've spent versus how much money they have earned, a lot of times they're in the negatives. Yeah, you earned that rank and you got that bonus check, but how much of your own money did you have to spend on product to hit the goals to get that rank and bonus check? It's such a messed up system. And I think your story really speaks to that desperation and the scrambling that goes on at the end of the month. And I completely agree with you that that would make me so stressed out. And you kind of have to ask yourself, is this pressure really worth it? Because I think if you're honest with yourself, you would realize it's not worth it. Thank you for your story. And with that, my friends, it's all the stories I have for you for this MLM Horror Stories video today. Thanks for sticking with me through another one of these. This is the 79th video in the series. I am just so blown away that there is enough content to make this many videos about it, but the emails just keep rolling in, which is really a testament to how messed up the industry of multi-level marketing is and how we need to keep talking about it. So thank you to everybody who sent in their story for this video. I really appreciate you for that. And if you have your own that you have not sent in, but would like to, the instructions for how to do that are in the description box of every video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you and I'll see you in my next one real soon. Thank you.